We see episode two. Doctor Demina asa be din komo edi afa. Eye Easter celebration ho. Na this time around no. Wa ko deep pa enya asem kitwa. E na asa nswa kasa afa eye Christo sumo ho. Aman fwa se papa no oye antichrist. Aman fwa se papa no the teaching sinya papa. Aman fwa se papa no nse mo awo kanto asumo. Me nim dia wonso be chwa dia fa ho dia. But nse mo awo be kan e wo video we mo no. Me pe wonso adu nchere aso Christo ni dia papa yiki ken. Anko for AT or share or huge fans and yasam kitwa, Dr. Demina and yasam kitwa. Or near so for need the sea and you are not a whole need be the sea and you are gone and yes and yasam kitwa. And your barbecue king won't so a wood tea as a Christo ni as we did in you. Why didn't you know and the same? The papa king and the crib womb and I say and throw. Missy Master Mom be beside when the videos who win and the crib womb and I say and throw for a comment to go comment section. At Easter, there's no resurrection, right? What, how should Christians look at the essence of Easter? That Christ came to die for my sins and what else? Well, the whole essence of Easter is predicated on the fact that man sinned and man didn't have the wherewithal to help himself from his sins. Mm -hmm. Man had everything. He had the knowledge to invent, innovate, create, but man didn't have the resources to cure the problem of sin. So God became a man in the person of Jesus Christ to die on behalf of man as a substitute. All right, so Jesus died on our behalf, was buried, and on the third day, he rose triumphantly, defeating sin, death, and the grave. So every year, Christians all over the world, and non-Christians alike, stand still at the time of Easter to recognize that there was a time when the savior of this world came into this world, died, rose again, and the Christian faith is predicated on those events, which begins with the incarnation, where God became a man. The book of Isaiah says his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. So Jesus is Mighty God. Jesus is Everlasting Father. Jesus is the Prince of Peace, which means, therefore, that the birth of Christ, which we call a birth, was actually an incarnation, a miracle. Because Mary said to the angel, how can these things be seen? I know not a man. So there was no, no will of man involved because John 1, 12 and 13 says that Jesus was made not of the will of man, nor of flesh, nor of blood, but of God. So that's why the best way theologically to look at it is what we call the incarnation, a miracle, a fusion of deity into humanity for the purpose of giving legality to the work of redemption. Man sinned, man died, to save man from sin. That's the whole concept of the Easter. So it begins with the incarnation, the descent of God into humanity, the death of Jesus, his burial, and his resurrection, and consequently his ascension to the right hand of majesty on high. That's why that event sets the tone. It sets the foundation for all of Christian belief, all of Christian pra practice, and guarantees eternity with God. How did Christianity Okay, the word Christianity. Peter, the apostle, never called himself a Christian. Paul, the apostle, never called himself a Christian. Jesus Christ didn't call himself a Christian. But Jacob, Isaac, they called themselves Jews. And that was the essence of their worship. Being a Jew denoted a culture where you worship the God of Abraham, Jacob, Isaac, and Isaac. And Jacob. Yep. So they gave a designation to who they are. Yep. Where did Christianity come from, the word Christianity? Well, the word Christianity came from the teaching ministry of Brother Paul in Antioch. After teaching Christ to those disciples of his over a period of time, because the gospel of Christ is, is, is transformative. And as they began to focus on that message of Christ's death, his burial, his resurrection. A transformation began to happen in their lives. Where those who observed this transformation could identify the transformation to what they saw in Christ. So they decided to call them Christians, Christ-like. That's where Christianity came from, out of Paul's teaching ministry of the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Christianity is an English word, is it? It's a, it's a, it's a Greek word. Christianity. It comes from Greek. It's a Greek word? Yep. The word Christ is Greek? Yes, Christos is Greek. But Christianity appeared to have been amplified by Rome, the Roman Empire. They spoke Latin, didn't they? Yes, they did. So did they, as Latin speakers, the powerful political empire, 
adopt a Greek terminology? Yes, they did. You know, when the Bible was written, English was not in existence at all. Mm -hmm. Because English is just about 800 years or thereabout. So when Christianity, I mean, when the Bible was written, there was no English language. That's why it's a translation from the Greek and the Hebrew, and of course, the Latin Vulgate, which includes, you know, the Aramaic, which is broken Greek, which Jesus spoke. So, yeah, it's a Greek word. It's a Greek word. The people who live in Rome, who are not Christians, they look at Christianity as a political empire situated in the Vatican in Rome. And it has been there for 2,000 years. And the Roman Empire sort of wrought the Christian philosophy and the religion. And as they say, imposed it on the rest of the world, sometimes through war. How do you relate to the statement that if a person lives in Rome, he's not a Christian, and you tell him, he said, this Christianity is nothing spiritual. It's a political empire sitting at the Vatican. He can point this to you. That this is the Vatican. This is the heart of Christianity. This is where Christianity is. This is the citadel of it. It's not any spiritual religion. It's a political authority of Rome. Well, again, remember also when Jesus was on earth, there were the Jews, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, the, 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 you know, the teachers of the law. They were part of the religion called Christianity as a den and Jesus brought a teaching that differed from what they were teaching the religious leaders of their day the Somebody Judaism is, leaders the leaders of Judaism yes Judaism mm -hmm. leaders mm -hmm. because they were actually the leaders of the synagogue yes yes and they constituted the authority of the day but they were not Christians they were Judaism people yes that's why I said the Christianity of their day I'm just using but they that call word it Judaism. loosely yeah it's, 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 it's still, called, still Judaism is still on till yeah today. so that's what because they were. it's a religion that is based on the worship of the law of Moses mm -hmm. and the worship by using you know the teachings of Moses in the law you know as as as, as they were relating with God all right but when Jesus showed up Jesus brought the teachings that differed from their own teachings that's why the Bible says, from whence has this man this wisdom that he spoke with such authority, not as the scribes and the Pharisees. Which means that even in Jesus' time, there was religion, Judaism and all of that, just like you have Rome today. Mm -hmm. All right, But it didn't interfere with the emphasis of the gospel of Christ. When we talk about Christianity today, the modern Christianity, we sometimes push the law aside and we often say we are not under the law. Is that correct? We're not under the law. We're not under the law? Yep, we're not okay, under the law. Okay, hold it there. The Bible said, This word of the law shall not depart from your mouth. Yep. You shall meditate on it day and night. Yep. Then will you make your way prosperous yep. and have good success. I believe it's in Exodus somewhere. Uh, it's in Joshua chapter 1 verse yes. 8. This word of the law. This book of the This law. book of the law. What law is it? Is that? Okay, so remember Moses is dead. Joshua takes over from Moses. Moses has laid down laws that govern Israel on their way to the promised land. Remember, they came out of Egypt. Moses left them halfway. Mm -hmm. And when Moses was about to die, in Numbers 27, verse 16 and 17, Moses said, let the Lord God, the God of all flesh, set a man over a congregation that will lead Israel to the promised land. So God asked Mo Moses to, to recommend, and Moses recommended Joshua. So Moses is dead. Joshua takes over. But before Joshua takes over, Moses instructs Joshua, there's a book of the law that will not depart out of your mouth if you're going to succeed in leading them to the promised land. So that statement was not made to you. It was made to Joshua specifically in that context that he will need the book of the law, which is like you're going to pastor these people. You will need the law of God in your mouth to feed them and pastor them to the promised land. Oh, so that word is only for Joshua. It was for Joshua. Not for us. Well, there are lessons to learn because the book of Romans chapter 15 verse 4 says, What things soever were said aforetime, they were written for our learning. So there are things to learn in it. What are the things to learn? Number one, that if you meditate the scriptures, you meditate the word of God, the word of God will make you prosper in your relationship with God and in how you live upon the face of the earth. And there's a corroboration to that. David now will say in Psalm 1 verse 1, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor seated in the seat of discomfort. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in the law of the Lord does he meditate day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. His leaf also shall not wither, that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. Whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. So the lesson there is that if you meditate God's word and spend time meditating and pondering, the word of God will infiltrate your, your subconscious infiltrate your mind and order your mind to think in line with God's thought and God's thoughts is God's wisdom so you begin to navigate your way through life using the wisdom of God but that's bringing us back to the controversial point you just said navigate your way through life 
using the wisdom of God. Yes. So I'm a businessman. Yes. Navigate my way through my business life. Yes. Using the word of God, I become prosperous. Yes. Another person can be prosperous. Yes. He doesn't use Jesus. Yes. He may use something else. Yes. Because the devil has power to make wealth, isn't it? That's what the Bible said. It said the Lord your God giveth you power to make wealth. Well, he added again, no sorrow. that context. The is, devil told Jesus that I can give all this to you. Well, again, that context has to be explained again. When he says, thou shalt remember the Lord thy God. In Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 18, that it is he that giveth thee power to make wealth. Mm -hmm. He was speaking to Israel on their way from Egypt to the promised land. Mm -hmm. That you shall remember when God brought you out of Egypt, he gave you clothes you didn't buy. He gave you shoes you never bought. You were hungry, you had money, but you couldn't buy food. He gave you manna. You shall remember that through your journey from Egypt to the promised land, God gave you power to make wealth, to prosper in the land. That's what Joshua I mean, was telling the children. It's not for people. us. It's not for us. It, it's a context. How do we make wealth then? We make wealth by industry. We make wealth by business. We don't, we don't need to obtain power from God to make wealth. God already gave every human being power. Your brain, you went to school, you studied. That's you what the power is understand. about. That's what the power is about. Today. So when I pray, should I pray for my business? Oh, sure. You pray for your business. Then because you're a child of God, the Holy Spirit gives you direction. He gives you, you know, wisdom. He gives you ideas, concepts. But with all of that, you still need skills developed in school. You need all of that to be able to navigate. What you are saying is that if you are not trained as a lawyer, yes, there's no amount of law the Holy Spirit can teach you there's and it will work. There's Holy no. Spirit can teach law, but you have to first be a lawyer to be qualified as a lawyer. Is that what you're saying? Yes. So that you set the foundation for the support of the Holy Spirit to come upon it. Well, even with that, the Holy Spirit is limited to your, to your brain power. He cannot make you do what your brain does. But he can give you more information. Well, the once you're already a doctor, the information he can give you the more Holy information. Spirit will give you is not in the law profession. It will be in giving you direction on when to speak, when not to speak, where to go, where not to go, when to get involved, when not to get involved. But when he gives you all of that direction, your expertise in law will be required to make you excel in that pursuit. Can he remind you of Article 19 if you needed it in court and you had forgotten? Can the Holy Spirit tell you that? Check Article. Can, some, can you feel a sense of something that says, check Article 19? Again. And then you open the court article and say, yes. That's again, what that's part of the leading of the Spirit. Mm -hmm. He will lead you. He will guide you. He will remind you things you have forgotten, but there are things you already know. That's what I'm saying. You've yes. read it before in school, but yes. you've forgotten. Yes. Or you have not noticed that it is relevant for the point you are making now. Yes. And then you can be reminded can that check out to remember. Yes, he can remind you things. Then you make money thereby. Yes, you make money. So Holy Spirit has helped you to make So money. again, remember in our last interview, we said, yes, the Holy Spirit will give you direction and leading and help you because you're a child of God. But that is not why you succeeded. You succeeded because you had the required skill, you had the required equipment with which to succeed. So if I'm a pastor and I'm a teaching my congregation and I come to the church and I say that, separate the architect sit here, the lawyer sit here, the doctor sit here, the rest of you go to the other auditorium, let me talk to this group of people. And I tell them that you are an architect, you're a lawyer, a doctor, you're sitting in this church. You start your work without prayer. If you're an architect and you have a project, do five days fasting before you start. Hear from the Spirit before you start. And those of you who hear from the Spirit, come and give a testimony. Is that a prosperity gospel? Well, that's not a prosperity gospel. It's not. That's but, like but I'm giving, urging that's them like to bringing, use the Bible to that, make money. Yes, that's like and come bringing, and testify. That's like, and you will need that prayer for every other area of your life. I agree. Exactly. So that's like bringing the fundamental principles of the Christian life to bear. For those architects, you know, uh, lawyers, mm -hmm. to know that as a child of God, whether you are going to the court of law or not, every day, you've got to pray and fellowship with God. You've got to speak to God. Basic principles of the Christian life. And then I add that when you pray and you succeed, give God a dangerous offering. <laughs> the moment you put that, you've messed up the entire discourse. Why? Why do you have to give God a dangerous offering? Because you acknowledge that it is the prayer and the five days work that gave you a sterling qualities, reminded you of all your architectural principles, and you're able to deliver. So give God a dangerous offering. As long as the dangerous offering is coming as thanksgiving. Yes, it is. Oh, sure. Why not? But that's, that, that's the point. It's thanksgiving. But yes. it has to be a dangerous one. Well, not, some, not some $200. <laughs> bring heavy. Something well, heavy. But, but the truth of the matter is, Jesus said, whoever is forgiving much, love it more. If the person truly realizes that it is God that helped him, you know, to, 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 to succeed in life. He wouldn't need to be motivated to do that. He would do it naturally. 
Yeah, but sometimes you have to talk to them. Sometimes you have to teach them. Yeah. You have to show them their responsibilities. But ultimately, they have to make the decision of what they want to give. If and the Bible says, if a man giveth according to what he has, it is acceptable. If I have three pastors, and I see one of the pastors is very adept at talking to these professionals and, and reminding them to come and give an offering, and then I give him a role in the pastoral ministry, this guy will be responsible for professionals. Every Wednesday, he's going to talk to them. Am I diverting the... Uh, salvation message? Am I well, diluting it? Well, for a child of God who has the nature of God in him, the nature of God is given. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. You already have that nature in you. You don't need too much uh, mobilization, too much. No, no, no. You just need to come into your realities. The gospel of Christ will stir up those deposits of God in the believer and they will flow naturally as he begins to grow in the knowledge of Christ. Interesting. Yep. So, uh, the last time we spoke, a uh, few things came out, especially the prosperity gospel. We'll get to that in a minute. But I was just looking at the video this morning. That was comparing uh, a testimony or a message that you gave, compared it to two other pastors. Uh, with the with, with uh, benefit of your indulgence, I can mention their names. I'm referring to Bishop Oyedipo and uh, uh, Pastor Adeboye. The subject matter was about the salvation. And whether or not a Christian can lose his salvation after he has obtained salvation, your view was different from theirs. I come to that. When can it be said that I have obtained salvation? What happens? Is it the go to church, raise up your hand, those of you who are at the back? Or the, how do I know that? I, because when I was growing up in school, there were some people who said something interesting. They said that they didn't need to be born again because they were born into it. Hmm. He was born by a Pentecost pastor from age two. He's been in the church. Age six, he's in the church. It's age is in the church. Seventeen, he's singing in the church. The twenty, what what is God? God says, raise your hand. So any time that altar call, as we called it, yeah. the altar call came, he was beyond it. So he didn't stand up because he's already in. When does one have salvation? How do you know? Well, first of all, the Bible tells us in Romans chapter 10 from verse 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10. It says, Say not in your heart, who shall go up to heaven to bring Christ down? Or who shall go to the grave to raise Christ from the dead? He says, But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in your heart and in your mouth. That's the word of faith which we preach. That if you shall believe in your heart the Lord Jesus and confess with your mouth that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. So salvation is predicated on the message. When the gospel, and Brother Paul tells us what the gospel is. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3 and 4. From verse 1, he started by saying, The gospel which I receive, I've delivered unto you. Verse 3, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Then he said in verse 14, If Christ be not risen, he says, then our gospel is vain. In verse 17, he says, if Christ is not risen from the dead, then you are deceived, you are still in your sins. Which means salvation will be predicated upon the message and understanding of the message of his death, burial, and resurrection. If that message has not been clearly communicated, even if a man answered the altar call, that man is not saved. It has to be the fact that he died as a substitute on your behalf. He was buried, and on the third day, he rose again. Understanding that message, even without coming to the altar, just that understanding within microseconds, you get saved. Hmm. Let me give you an example. When I was in secondary school, there were a lot of the young boys who they didn't want to associate with Christianity, and we called them unbelievers. And uh, there was a big distinction in my boarding school between believers and unbelievers. So as a junior, one of the seniors called me. He was laughing at me. He said, why do you both call us unbelievers? I want to know. And I said, because you don't believe in the resurrection of Christ. He said, just that. I said, oh, yeah. He said, oh, but I believe. So I was stunned. I was 13 years old. He was about 17. He said, I believe. That's all. That's why you call us unbelievers. That we don't believe. I believe. Then I was, he said, so am I a believer? Because I believe. Mm -mm. I said, well, I don't know. He started celebrating. I'm a believer. Now I've become a believer no. because I believe. No. Why do we call them unbelievers? They are called unbelievers because the message is preached. They didn't understand the message. They didn't receive the message. So nothing happened in their hearts. How do we know that? Well, because it's happening in their hearts. Well, you will know that because once a man is truly saved, something happens. 
something happens. First of all, he himself is, is persuaded about it. Secondly, he begins to bring fruits of salvation. There will be fruits to eat. It's not just mouth. There will be fruits. Because if it's just mouth, the Bible says, Satan believes that there is God and he trembles. So Satan believes, but he's not saved. So that somebody says, I believe that Jesus is, he died. It's not enough. It, you have to receive the entire message, the complete message, in your heart. And then believe it in your heart. Then the miracle happens right in the heart of him. But how do we ascertain it? Shakespeare said there's no art to find the mind's construction in the face. How, this is so mental, so internal, so intangible. The man to whom that miracle happened in his heart will know it. Yes, I will know and, it. And that's what happened. I will know it. And but that's how would you know that? But I'm I will know that eventually because the fruit of salvation, which begins with the joy of salvation, the peace of God, all of that is what will lead into the transformation of your life. And you can see the fruit, love, joy, peace, gentleness, meekness, temperance. All of those are fruits associated with salvation. Once a man receives salvation, those fruits will gradually begin to find expression. And that's how we will get to know that this man is truly saved. If you have two households, a man and a wife, a man and a wife in two different households, one of them is Christian, goes to church, so we assume that he's saved. The other one is not, because on Sundays they don't go to church. They are sitting outside eating and waiting to watch football. But you find that the one who is supposed to be saved does not express the salvation manifestations, joy, peace, love. The other one does. If you're looking at a situation like that, and you can find many, what do we say? Who is saved and who is not saved? Well, again, remember salvation is a birth into Christ. You are born again. All right, Jesus said to Nicodemus, Nicodemus said to Jesus, what, what, you know, he says, Rabbi, you're a teacher come from God, and no one can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. And Jesus said to Nicodemus, except a man be born again. So salvation is a birth. You are born anew. The word anathem genoa. Mm -hmm. You are born anew. A birth. It's not like an item on the shelf. It's a birth where God's life fuses into you and brings you from death to life and becomes one with you. So you are one spirit with God. It's a birth. And when that happens, the Bible says, likewise, the spirit beareth witness with our spirit. There will be a witness of the spirit. There will be a conviction that leads to a transformation. It will be so obvious. It will be very difficult to fake it. If you fake it, it's just, it won't be too long. It will be obvious that you are just faking it. There's a power that will come into you. The Bible says in John 1, 12, as many as receive him, to them gave you power to become the sons of God. So there's, there's ability, there's power that will be unlocked in your heart. There will be, it will be very obvious. You will know it. And those who know you will know that something has happened. Even if the fruits are not yet obvious. It's just a matter of time. All the fruits will show forth. Hmm. With this understanding, you said once a person has salvation, he cannot lose it. Yes. Oedipo says salvation can be lost. And so did Adebo say. And I'm just looking at it with the physical mind and physical presence. You go to court. Uh, you are accused of an offense. The judge says you are acquitted and discharged. For the moment, you are. But if you were to commit a crime, that acquittal will not stand anymore. Is it different in, in God's law? Yeah, it's different. Because the death you are of, saved, you are saved forever. Yes, because, You're going to heaven. Yes, because the death of Christ is once and for all. In the book of Hebrews, he says, but this man, after he has suffered, you know, he, he, he obtained eternal salvation for us. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes shall not perish, but have everlasting life, eternal life. So what the believer receives is God's life. And it's a birth. Jesus will say to Nicodemus, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Except a man be born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom. He uses the word birth. So when you are born, you are born. And Nicodemus said to Jesus, how can a man be born again when he's old? Shall he go into his mother's womb the second time and be born? Jesus said, are you a teacher of the Jews and you're speaking like this? That which is born of flesh is flesh. And that which is born of spirit is spirit. Meaning, once you are born a human being, you can never go back to your mother's womb to come out an animal. Same thing, once you are born of God, a child of God, you cannot unborn yourself. You are born, you are born. Irrespective of how you conduct your life after the, um, after the 
Yeah. Irrespective, but I say that irrespective cautiously because once you're born of God, his nature takes hold of you. Yes, you may have mistakes here and there, but the difference is if you're not born again, those mistakes, you will enjoy them. If you're born again, you will know that you are in a territory you don't belong to. You will not have pleasure in sin. You will not. Even if you fall into sin, you'll be sad because, you know, this environment is not my natural environment. And you want to come out very quickly. But if you fall into sin, and you know that this is sin, and you did it, are you suggesting to us that because you are saved, your cleansing uh, power is faster? And therefore, you are cleansed of every sin you commit. But that's what the Bible teaches. So once you are born again, you will go to heaven, irrespective of what happens well, afterwards. Once you are born again, because you go to heaven, not because you are a good person. You are heaven bound because you believe in what Christ has done. Nothing to do with what you, how you conducted your life. Well, how you conducted your life will be affected by what Christ has done as you grow in that knowledge. I don't understand that. Now, so the day you receive Jesus, mm -hmm. Jesus comes in. You and Jesus becomes one. But you have a mind that stored up memory of your past life. Now, there's a battle between your past life and this new nature that is in your spirit. So we start teaching you the word of God. Your mind, the files, the old files, begins to get deleted by the knowledge of God's word. And new files are stored into your memory. So your life starts changing. But there are some old files that have not yet gone. So you find out that you are doing some things you used to do before. Not because that is your new destination, but because of memory. So as you keep receiving God's word, the transformation is progressing. That's why the Bible in Corinthians says, but we all with open face, beholding the glory of God as in a mirror, are changed into that same image from glory to glory, even as by the spirit of God. So the teaching of God's word begins to renew your mind to align with your new reality. And as that reality begins to dawn on your consciousness, your steps, your lifestyle, your speech, your conduct begins to be affected by the new nature in you. You may make mistakes here and there. So if you, you slip, it will be cleansed. It. If you slip, it will be cleansed. Because the, the Bible the says... The difference with the other guy who is not born again, when he slips, he has no redemption. He has no cleansing. Ah, I get it. That's why the book of 1 John chapter 2 says, My little children, these things write I unto you. He's talking to believers. That you sin not. But if any man sin... We have an advocate with the Father, mm. Jesus Christ, the righteous, who is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. John will put it like this again in 1 John chapter 1, verse 7. He says, when you sin, the blood of Jesus' his son cleanseth from all unrighteousness. Mm. The Bible tells us in the book of Ephesians, he says that Jesus may present to himself a church without spot or recall or any such thing which means you are jesus's responsibility you know uh, paul this is it the word salvation mm -hmm. is the greek word soteria that soteria is a greek word that comes from a culture now that word soteria comes from another word the sota the sota is like an emperor who goes to battle defeats his enemies takes over the territory lives in the territory to secure the territory so Jesus is the sota of salvation, mm -hmm. the sota of soteria. When Jesus comes in, he conquers your entire life. Then he lives inside you to secure that territory. He doesn't go anywhere. He lives in there to secure that territory. That's why Jesus will say, all that the Father has given to me, none is lost. Except the son of perdition, which was Judas Iscariot. That's why Jesus will say in John 10, 28 and 29, I give unto you eternal life and you shall never perish. Neither shall any man be able to pluck you out of my hand. My father that gave you to me is able to keep you from falling. So once a man is born again, he is born into Christ. Christ secures him. It's like you have a house. Your house doesn't take care of itself. Your house doesn't paint itself. Your house doesn't sweep itself. It is the owner of the house that sweeps the house. It's the owner of the house that paints the house. It is the owner of the house that sustains the house. You are God's house. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. So it is God's responsibility to clean you of every sin and every stain. It is God's responsibility to keep you always clean and pure from sin. And that is the job of the sota in the, in the saved. He lives in you forever. Two more questions on this segment and then we move on to another segment. The, 
argument in the Garden of Eden. I'm asking this on the basis that we, you said, and other pastors also say, that a man sinned and a man came for redemption. This happened and that happened. The Adam and Jesus. They called Jesus the second Adam. In the Garden of Eden, in the account that we read, the sin was shifted. Adam, in his advocacy before God, said that it is the woman who gave the thing to me. If you read the narrative, the woman first encountered the deceiver. Why did God decide that the sin is the man's sin? So that if he's bringing redemption, he came through a man. Why didn't the redemption come through a woman? Well, remember, the book of Genesis has an after-event reportage. Because Moses wrote Genesis. Moses wasn't there when it happened. Which means two things were responsible. Number one, oral tradition. Number two, a vision. And the language of vision sometimes... Oral tradition? Yes, oral tradition. Moses, Moses spoke to somebody? Yes, people, people who documented the events of Genesis. Oh, sure. I thought the inspiration of the Holy Spirit came upon Moses and he wrote everything. Well, the inspiration of the Holy Spirit comes on men not to give them the information, but to inspire them to write. And in the writing, you collate materials. Look at the way uh, Brother Paul will put it in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15. He says, And that from a child you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. The next verse. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. Mm -hmm. Now, let me break the two words down. The first word in verse 15 says, From a child you have known the holy scriptures. The word holy scriptures is the word herios grammar in the Greek, in the Greek where it was originally written. Herios grammar means you have known the subject matter. You have known the, the content. You have known the letters of the scriptures. Then in verse 16, all scripture is the word pas graphe. Pas graphe means all the writings, the documentation is given by inspiration. So the inspiration of God is in the art of documenting. It's like I said, Mr. Paul, please help me get to government house. When you get to government house, every event you observe, document for me. And then you saw the driver of the president slap the driver of the, of the vice president. Now, I inspired you to document, but I did not inspire the driver of the president to slap the, the, the driver of the, deputy, of the vice president. But I inspired you to document. So the inspiration is in the documentation, not in the activities. Because it was in the Spirit of God that inspired Eve to sin against God. But the Spirit of God inspired Moses to document the So why do we attribute the sin to Adam and not Eve? Well, again, like I say, it's an after-event reportage. Yes. So you will now come to the New Testament to truly understand what happened in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. The Old Testament is called mystery. The New Testament is called revelation. The word musterion in the Greek. Musterion means that which requires interpretation. The New Testament is called Revelation Apocalypsis. It means to unveil. So the New Testament unveils the Old Testament. All right. So what does the New Testament say about the event in Eden? Paul will say in Romans chapter 5 verse 12, Wherefore, as by one man, sin entered into the world. The word entered is the Greek word esekomai. It means a foreign object that did not exist was introduced into the world. So where was it introduced from? Jesus will give us answers to that. He says, know you not that it is not what goes into a man that defiles the man, but what comes out of a man. For from within the heart of man proceed evil thoughts. So the fall of Adam and Eve were thoughts in their mind that rejected God. But why Adam, not Eve? Well, both of them. So why did we say we bring in a second Adam, not a second Eve? Well, Adam was the head of the team. Okay. So he takes responsibility for everything that happens. So that's the lesson from there. That's the lesson. That the man, the husband. He takes responsibility for the running of the home. Were the Adam and Eve married? Adam and Eve? Were they married? They were married by, 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 the, by the fact that God brought the two of them together as the first man and woman to begin the human There was no race. ceremony. No, there doesn't have to be ceremony. Marriage doesn't have to have a ceremony because marriage is cultural, depending on what culture. If you belong to an African culture. So we culture, understand that marriage is cultural. It's cultural. But African marriage in the cultural context is polygamous. Well, that is why, again, in polygamy, as a child of God, the Bible does not tell you how to marry, where to marry. But the Bible teaches you how to live in marriage, how to function within the confines of marriage. 
And if the word of God is going to teach you how to function within the confines of marriage, the word of God does not submit to culture. Culture submits to the word of God. So that is where that, that, that change comes. Once you get born again and you receive Christ, you now want to function within the confines of God's word as much as possible as you live within a culture. Has God's word prescribed monogamy as the proper style of marriage? Well, remember the last time we spoke about the patterns. Mm -hmm. God gave Moses Adam and Adam and Eve. And then look at the fathers. The fathers all through the scriptures. Abraham, you know, look at Isaac, look at David. And you find jump Jacob. Look at Jacob. He got married twice. Yes, he got married twice. Again, but like I say, there are examples in scripture that you look at the wisdom of God and how it functioned. What was the outcome of those examples? And what was the downside of those examples? And as a wise person, you want to go with the pattern that produced peace and produced comfort and produced confidence. Abraham married only one. Yes. But there was no peace in his house. Well, there was no peace in his house because he walked by the f he he produced a generation by the flesh which was contrary to the word of god because god gave abraham a promise i'm going to give you a child a miracle child and abraham was too impatient and abraham walked by the flesh and produced ishmael that was not god's choice god's choice was isaac was that a, a sin that was a sin but god blessed ishmael well god blessed ishmael because it was not ishmael's fault that he came did god punish abraham for that you can see the punishment till tomorrow. Which one? The Jews and the Palestinians. Is that it's correct information? Long, yes, it's been a long standing. Ishmael is, is the foundation of it's been the a Arab long, world. It's been a long standing battle from Genesis. Check How it. do we know that? Is, is there is an there anthropological the or, is there or the archaeological is there? reason to say that Ishmael, after having been banished by Abraham, sent the Bible describes in the geography north wars, northeast. And then he settled there and became very prosperous. How do we say that that's the Arabs? Again, remember. Why is that not South African? Why is that not <laughs> again, Danish? Again, remember, the Bible has types and shadows that can be traced. In Galatians chapter 4, uh, Paul broke it down. That which was born after the flesh persecuted that which was born after the spirit, Correct. which is an allegory. Mm -hmm. Speaking of the flesh and of the spirit. Speaking of uh, Ishmael and mm -hmm. Isaac which is what we have today in Israel and Palestine. How do we know it's Palestine? Israel has many enemies. Oh, they do. Yes, so, they do. It, uh, so but most of the Ishmael enemies... Ishmael being their principal enemy could be anywhere. Yeah, most of their enemies are from outside, but Ishmael is from inside. So Paul said in Galatians that enemies is from inside? Four. Chapter 4. He said that which was born after the flesh persecuted that which was born after the spirit, mm -hmm. which is an allegory. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. and then he talked about um, he talked about uh, the, the you know the plan of God, which was Abraham to wait for God to give him a child at the right time. But Abraham was not patient to wait, so he went after the flesh and produced Ishmael, which became a conflict between the two of them. And that conflict, the impact of it is still on, because the flesh and the spirit is used very predominantly in Scripture to teach works. And the finished work of Christ. Mm -hmm. The spirit is the finished work of Christ. Ishmael is a type of man trying to qualify for God's acceptance. Isaac is what Christ has done qualifies a man who believes in Christ. So that's why it's an allegory in scripture that communicates a lot of spiritual realities. But there are physical lessons to learn from the event itself.